It's um, Patrick here from Kintsugi Hope. It is such a privilege to be with you. And uh, most of you know Kintsugi is a Japanese word that means golden jewelry. And if we break a bowl, we tend to mend it with super glue in this country and uh, try and hide the cracks, right? And uh, what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. It certainly becomes our un uh, unique. And in Kitsugi Hope, we believe that beauty comes out of brokenness. And, uh, and so we have this 12-step well-being program that is delivered at the moment on Zoom and in communities, um, encouraging people to look at faith and emotional and mental health. So do check that out if that is helpful for you. I've um, also got a number of resources that may be helpful at this time. Um, we've tried to reduce the cost of these just to be helpful. Um, honesty over silence, it's okay not to be okay. Um, we've done a DVD of that as well, for those who are not into reading. You know, when faith gets shaken, and where is God when suffering happens? And there's a DVD of that. And then a journal. I found journaling in times of challenge really, really important for our emotional mental health. Um, you can get those off the Kintsugi Hope website, along with some Kintsugi jewelry. Um, these are bespoke and handmade. Um, they're just beautiful. Nice thing to give someone who's struggling. Um, I want to look at Psalm 13. And uh, Psalm 13 is an absolutely fascinating psalm of lament. It's a psalm where David is waiting. Now, I don't know about you, but waiting for me can feel frustrating, disorientating. I get quite angry when I'm waiting. Um, it's lonely. It can be boring. Um, why go slow when you can go fast? And uh, uh, most of you know, nine years ago, I was diagnosed with this degenerative knee condition. Um, so I was told I was going to have two big operations, uh, have six screws drilled into my bones, uh, metal pins put through one side of my leg and out the other side of the leg. And uh, my wife was going to have to turn these screws. Um, and, um, and so I, in some ways, I was self-isolating for six months, and I had to do it differently um, for each leg. And you can see a picture of my leg here in this photograph. But every Monday morning, what we had to do is we had to go to hospital. And, uh, and there had to be two things that we had to do. One is we had to go and have blood tests. And the second thing was x-rays. Now, the blood tests, um, I didn't mind too much because you probably know, you go there and you take a ticket, and the ticket's got a number, and then there's a big sort of a screen and some red numbers come out, and you can sort of work out where you are in the queue. So you can sort of work out, oh, I've got 40 minutes to wait, I reckon. And you're looking around to see how fast it's going. Um, x-ray, on the other hand, I hated the x-ray. Because you just go up to the receptionist go, um, hi, it's Patrick Regan. And she'll say, um, take a seat, please, sir. And then an hour will go past. And then two hours will go past. And I don't know if you had this at the doctor's surgery as well. You go, they've forgotten me. They've only forgotten me. And then you're starting to think, oh, I need to go and say something. I need to go and say something. And then you're like, oh, I'm not sure. Am I allowed to go and say something? And then that moment, that moment happens where someone that came in after you gets seen before you. And the sense of outrage and injustice, and you start thinking, right, that is it. She's forgotten me. She's definitely forgotten me. And, uh, and then you let it go a little bit more. And then you get up, and you march up to the receptionist. And I'm like, um, excuse me, um, I've been waiting now for three hours. Have I been forgotten? Has my name slipped off the list? And normally when I do that, um, the doctor comes out and goes, oh, Mr. Regan, and, uh, and I feel a little bit of an idiot. Um, Psalm 13, David is feeling forgotten. Let's read this from verse 1. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? Day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I'll sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I've overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord's praise, for he has been good for me. You know what? Being forgotten is the most horrible feeling. Feeling like you're missing out. Um, at the moment, we're in lockdown. Uh, when you listen to this, I'm guessing that hopefully... 
Um, lockdown will be eased a little bit, but there'll still be social distancing. There's still going to be a long way to go. And we want answers. And the reality is, is people can't give certainty. And for some people, if we're really honest, we're struggling spiritually. Someone said to me, you know, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, but I'm really struggling spiritually. I'm really struggling to see where God is in this. And then what we can do is we can go to social media and we can look at how everyone's having an amazing quiet time and reading this book and doing that or doing a piece of art or doing a painting. And we can start playing top trumps of pain. And, uh, and we start going, oh, my goodness, I'm suffering and they're not. Or, or, or we look at people that are suffering worse than us and go, you know, my pain is not as bad as their pain. But waiting is part of what happened uh, in life and what happened in the Bible. Take Joseph, um, Genesis 41. Joseph is in a place of influence in Egypt. But how did he get there? Well, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was hauled off into a foreign land. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. Joseph might have been praying these prayers. How long, Lord? Get me out of here. And then you know the story. He interprets the dream of a couple of inmates in prison. And, and he says, don't forget me. He says this, remember me and get me out of here. The cupbearer assured him that he would not forget. What happens? Two years later, Genesis 40, verse 1. Now it happened at the end of two years. Um, Pharaoh had a dream. Two years. Two more years he had. Two more years laying in prison. Did God just forget him in that time? Paul. You know, Paul was the greatest apostle to the Gentiles. He was desperate to get to Rome and then on to Spain to preach the gospel. How did he get to Rome? He was put in prison on a false charge for two years. Why didn't God do something? Surely Paul was the main man at this point. Had God forgotten Joseph or Paul or in David in this psalm? At the end of Paul's life, he's in self-isolation. Yet. From that place of self-isolation, the gospel goes like you wouldn't believe. It goes throughout the world. So these psalms are so important for us at a time that there's psalms of lament. 40% of the psalms are lament. Psalms of disorientation. And they have like this, most psalms of uh, uh, lament have these different sections to them. The first section, the introduction, often starts out with a cry. You know, verse 1 says, How long, Lord? There's a how, there's an honesty to it. There's, David isn't holding anything back. He's expressing his anger, his disappointment, his doubts before God. Certain people, I think, are dangerous. The guys that flew the planes into the Twin Towers on 9-11, they were certain they were doing the right thing. Healthy doubt isn't a bad thing. He's saying, God, are you ignoring my pain? God wants to hear our genuine feelings, even when we're angry against him. You know, he wants us to turn our face to him. Complaining, actually, when you look at it in a biblical sense, is about turning your back on someone. No, turn your face to them. He uses the term in verse 1, Lord, Yahweh. He's still saying that you're Lord God, you are still Yahweh, though I don't get this and I feel abandoned. The second key thing about this psalm is, is what they call the lament proper. And it has sort of these three themes to it. Number one is I'm hurting. Number two is you don't care. And number three is my enemies winning. In other words, life isn't going to plan. And you know, so often that's the case to us. The Psalms is a great model for us to do lament better. They are brilliantly written. And they're sometimes they're quite general. You can almost place yourself in this Psalm. The reality, life doesn't work out for everyone. People do get coronavirus. People do suffer from anxiety, depression, self-harm. People do try and complete suicides. Marriages do break down. People are lonely. People are suffering from domestic violence. People have sat in church all their life and then decided to leave it because life is just too hard. If you struggle like me with some mental health issues, then actually sitting in church is lonely. Simplistic answers just don't do it for you anymore. Facebook pictures with the inspirational quote, they're nice, but they don't quite do it for you. Um, we often hear the don't worry, be happy sermon. Richard Forster says this, superficiality is the curse of the age. We have, uh, John Allberg says, we have exchanged depth for breadth. We want microwave maturity. The reality is, is you don't see many fridge magnets with Psalm 13 on it. You know what? 
this is maturity. This is maturity that when you struggle and you choose to trust in God, that is maturity. And I love this psalm because it puts into words sometimes some of those feelings of feeling overwhelmed. And it goes through all this sense of lament and it gets to verse um, five and it says, despite all of this, I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I'll sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Uh, finish with a story. Um, you know, the Psalms have been read at some of the lowest points in history um, by those who have suffered slavery and um, by those in the death camps in the concentration camp. And there's this one story um, which always got me. And uh, it's, a, it's a book called The Night. Um, and uh, it talks about this, um, uh, it's called Sad-Eyed Eagle. And it talks about the fact that actually in, they used to read the Psalms at nighttime in these concentration camps. They used to say, blessed be thou for giving us life, for sustaining us, and for enabling us to reach this day. But there was this particular um, story which absolutely broke me. Um, and uh, it's of a young boy. And they decided to hang a child in front of thousands of onlookers. And uh, it wasn't a, a, a small matter. The head of the camp read the verdict, and all the eyes were on this child. He was pale, he was calm, but he was biting his lip as he stand on the shadow of the gallows. And the timekeeper um, basically said, um, I, I can't act as the executor here. And, uh, and so the soldiers took his place. There was three prisoners. They condemned the prisoners together. Um, they stepped on chairs, and in unison, they kicked the chairs away. And the nooses were placed around their necks. The two men shouted out, long live liberty. But the boy remained silent. Someone said, where is God now? Where is this merciful God? At the signal, the chairs were tipped over. Total silence in the camp. On the horizon, the sun was setting. There was weeping. Cover your heads. Take your caps off. And then the prisoners were made to march past the victims. The two men were no longer alive. Their tongues were hanging out, swollen. But the third rope was still moving. The child, too light, was still breathing. And so stayed there for an hour, lingering between life and death. They were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when they passed by. His tongue still red, his eyes not yet extinguished. And behind me, for God's sake, a man said, where's God now? And from within me, he heard an answer. Where is he? He's hiding. He's hanging. He's hanging here on the gallows. You know what? God is there in the midst of suffering, in the midst of lament. And I want to spend, I don't know about you, about the rest of my lives, of going to those who feel forgotten, who feel God that's abandoned them. And I don't have simplistic answers for them. I don't have happy fridge magnets um, to give out. But I have a message that says God is there in the worst of those moments. The fascinating thing about um, Viktor Frankl, who wrote loads of stuff around the concentration camps, he says, you can take everything away from me, but you can't take away my attitude. Matt Redman's famous song, um, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, says, whatever may pass, whatever lies before me, let me be singing till the morning comes, because there will be a day when every tear and every pain and every heartache will be wiped away. But until that day comes, we get on and we care and we come alongside, and we lament, and we cry, and we be honest. It's okay not to be okay. God is with us. Father God, bless everyone that hears this talk. Let them know your presence. Let them trust in you in the midst of lament and grief and heartache. In Jesus' name, amen.